seminar of this semester. Um, welcome back uh, from uh, a nice, uh, enjoyable summer. I uh, hope you uh, had some time to relax uh, and um, uh, came <laughs> and came back to Berkeley refreshed to start uh, in the academic year. Um, so as you know, every Monday between uh, this time, we're going to have our seminar, particularly for the grad students. Uh, the first year, it's required to uh, come, but also it's not just because it's a requirement. Also, uh, hopefully, you will learn and see uh, something uh, new and exciting in what this profession has to offer you in the years to come. Uh, and also, the grad students who are not first years are always welcome to join. And today, we have a really full house. This is fantastic. I hope it stays that way. Uh, and. Uh, so welcome back, and uh, we start off with an exciting uh, speed up speaker, uh, Gary Johnson, uh, uh, is, who is going to be introduced by Coral, uh, is able to come here and hopefully uh, try to twist his arm a little bit today to come maybe a little bit more frequent and tell us about uh, uh, the things he learned in his uh, engagement. And so Coral, if you want to introduce him. Um, I have the privilege of meeting Gary at the ANS meeting in San Francisco a year ago, and I immediately said, we've got to hear this guy. Uh, we've got to have him for a colloquium. Um, I learned that our, uh, at least for a good long period of time, our, our careers ran uh, uh, tangent to one another. We were both at Livermore about the same time for 20 to 25 years or so. Um, he's worked at uh, not only Livermore, he then went to the uh, International Atomic Energy, uh, uh, Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. We had a very interesting experience there. Uh, he's worked for Portland General Electric Company, U.S. Department of Energy, and even had a stint as a, as a, as a big scholar here. Um, I won't go through all the uh, various uh, technical committees uh, that he's uh, supporting with the IAEA. Um, and I won't read his abstract either, uh, because I think we're going to hear quite a bit from him. But lessons learned from super accidents and nuclear accidents. Thank you, Gary, for coming. Thank you. I don't know how exciting I am. I usually the audience goes to sleep after the second slide, though. Oh. <laughs> So uh, my talk will give my general thoughts about what can be learned from past nuclear accidents and nuclear reactors. Before starting out, look at the Daniel Cunningham work. During this talk, you might conclude that some of our predecessors made crazy mistakes. These things look crazy to us, mainly because we benefited from the mistakes. Also, I'll talk about some of the events, but I only have time to touch upon a few main points. The events are really much more interesting than uh, I can convey in a short talk. And I uh, encourage you to, to have a look at some of them when you get the chance. During the Fukushima Daiichi accident in 2011, I was a member of the IAEA engineering team charged with giving the bosses our daily best estimates of the plant conditions. That led me to start thinking about how severe accidents happen. IAEA defines severe accidents as an accident more severe than a design basis accident involving significant core degradation. It's one of five fundamental plant states that they define as shown in the table. Note that what IAEA calls design extension conditions are typically called beyond design basis accidents in the US. After I retired from IAEA in 2013, I began to put some effort into this just for my own amusement. But on my first trip back to Vienna, one of my colleagues asked for a summary of severe accidents for their nuclear knowledge management program. I liked the idea. But now I had to take this work more seriously. Later, he asked me to develop video presentations about some of the events. And so far, I've made videos for TMI, Chernobyl, Fukushima Daiichi, and HTR3, which actually none of you have except for one. I, uh, I spoke about this work at an ANS meeting in 2015, and Joe Major from Epri was there and asked me to write a report on lessons learned for instrumentation control and human system interfaces. From here on out, I'll use the acronyms HSI and INC. So now I have three products, accident summaries, videos, and a 
never report for, for eight years. At the end of this video, I'll tell you how to get the uh, products. My first step was to make a list of severe accidents. I took account of earlier work and then went looking on the internet and in libraries for other events and accident reports. The internet has some crazy stuff, but nothing made it on this list unless I found a credible source that acknowledged that significant fuel damage was involved. In most cases, I was able to obtain the original accident reports. The internet is wonderful. In addition to being crazy, <coughs> accident reports are secondary documents that were based upon the original reports. I found 19 events. The plants include four generation two LWRs, seven other power reactors, two isotope production reactors, and six tests for research reactors, including NRX at Chalk River, which was the first severe accident. There might still be events I haven't found. And I actually suspect there are. Just having this list shows that severe accidents have been more common than we think. The red line shows the cumulative number of severe accidents by year. The shape of this curve shows that industry is improving. Currently, the conventional wisdom is that the frequency of severe accidents should be about 10 to the minus 7 per reactor year. But if we consider only the Gen 2 LWRs and decide that Fukushima Daiichi was one of them, not three, the frequency of severe accidents to through 2017 is slightly less than 10 to the minus 4 per reactor year. This is a much higher number than most people believe. I conclude from this that we should expect further severe accidents, and it will be some time before we reach the goal of 10 to the minus 7 per reactor year. A cursory look at the loss of calls both to aircraft and cargo ships indicates that the frequency of these events might also be about 10 to the minus 4 per year. These industries have been around a lot longer than nuclear power. We've had cargo ships for thousands of years. Could it be that 10 to the minus 4 per unit year is some kind of lower limit for severe accidents and complex systems? That would be a really great question to study. I hit the right button. After studying these accidents, I came to believe that severe accidents are black swans. The term black swan in this context was coined by Nassim Nicholas Talib. Black swan was a common expression in 16th century London for impossibility. Deriving from the old world presumption that all swans were white. The point is that for Europeans, all known swans were white until they discovered black swans in Australia. Caleb uses the term black swan for events that are hard to predict, have serious consequences, and that are obvious in retrospect. I believe that the pattern for severe accidents is that unknown or unrecognized hazards lay dormant until some trigger causes the latent hazard to become real hazards and creates an event that can't be brought under control before serious burden occurs. It's hard to predict an event when the conditions that cause it aren't recognized. You, you can't model what you don't understand. Kelly points out that someone predicting an event may not disqualify it from being a black swan. What's important is that those who are affected fail to perceive their thinking. For example, he notes that at Thanksgiving, the turkey is always surprised. <laughs> Next, I'll give you a simple example of this model, <coughs> an event that happened at Chapel Cross Unit 2 in the UK. 
Chapel Cross II was one of eight similar units of Gaskell reactors that used natural uranium fuel of the Magnox type. All in all, the first reactor in this series was the first nuclear power plant to generate industrial quantities of electricity in 1956. Plants in this series continued in service until 2004. In the early days, these plants had the dual role of producing electricity and plutonium. A little bit of background might help you to understand the other. Fuel assemblies were loaded and unloaded through the tubes shown on the left. The tubes passed through the reactor vessel head, and most of these tubes serviced 16 fuel channels. So a fuel assembly had to be manipulated a bit to get it into the correct fuel channel. The fuel channels shown on the right were columns of graphite bricks. In, uh, in Chapel Cross II, graphite sleeves were inserted into the channels to isolate the graphite bricks from the reactor floor. So that the graphite bricks were operated at higher temperature, high enough to prevent an accumulation of winter energy. These sleeves sometimes became dislodged or broke during the removal or insertion of fuel assemblies. It wasn't possible to detect such damage during the fuel level. Fuel failure was detected by a sampling system that monitored each group of 16 fuel channels. This picture shows some of the sample tubes. Gas from the tubes were sampled sequentially and sent to remote radiation detectors, selection, transport, sampling, and measurement delays meant that for each group of 16 channels, fission product measurements could be updated no faster than every 90 seconds. So to, to plug in the story in, in the model I did, in 1964, fuel assemblies, experimental fuel assemblies, were installed in several channels. In one case, part of the graphite speed was damaged either during or before loading the experimental fuel. The broken parts fell into the coolant path, restricting coolant flow past the deeper channels. The past the but here the still The affected channel would have run out, but the damaged channel was not was one that didn't have a fuel channel outlet temperature. So the operators were going for the problem. Three years later, fuel elements of a new design replaced most of the fuel. But the fuel in the damaged channel was left in the reactor. Engineers knew that the new fuel would increase the reactor coolant temperature by about 100 degrees C, but that was still 200 degrees C below the, the experimental channel's design temperature. When reactor power was brought up to about 200 megawatts thermal, the coolant flow in the damaged channel was no longer sufficient to cool the fuel assemblies, and fuel began to melt. Fuel failure was detected by a fission product, a fission product monitoring system, but the system response time and a procedural requirement to independently confirm the problem before spreading the plant delayed the reactor trip by one or two minutes. And that time, six fuel elements held. This was a pretty minor event, but I picked it to show you how a problem can lay dormant for a long time maybe even forever, without causing trouble, until just the right set of conditions trigger an event. But severe accidents aren't always so simple. Consider the TMI-2 accident. You guys all, all know TMI-2. So mm -hmm. the reactor fuel melted because of a stuck pressurizer power operated relief valve and failure to provide coolant makeup sufficient to replace the water loss through the PLRB. I'll give you a short synopsis of how these events transpired. The green text denotes things that went right. The event was initiated by isolation of a condenser polisher caused by a poor maintenance procedure. In unit one, an 
isolated polisher would have been automatically bypassed. So it's not the cause of reactor trip. But unit two didn't have this feature. So a turbine trip and a reactor trip. Safety systems worked as expected and started high pressure safety injection. When the time came for the operators to take action, a design error caused the control room indicator to show that the stuck open PRV was closed. A lack of information about a similar event, a desire to avoid a solid reactor coolant system, and poor, pre poor procedures supported the operator's belief that they were responding to a normal trip. They reduced the reactor coolant makeup rate as required by cramped procedures for a normal trip, when in fact they were confronting a lower. It's likely that they could have quickly recovered from that decision, except that the plant had been operating for some time with a PORV that was leaking more than allowed by the plant license. Because of this, the high PORV tailpipe temperatures that also indicated a stuck open PORV looked normal to the operators. Useful secondary displays that could have helped were not easily accessible. And poor training and thermodynamic principles and small break loader response didn't help them to diagnose the problem. As things got worse, the core exit temperatures would have identified the problem, but the temperatures were displayed considerably behind real time. And now our temperatures only a little bit higher than normal were shown as question marks. Reactor pressure vessel water level indication would have clearly shown the problem. But in those days, US PWRs didn't have RPV level indication. It was two and a half hours before the operators started to understand the plant's real state. By that time, it was very difficult to recover from the event, and more problems raised their head. Removing almost any one of the red things about it would have likely prevented the accident. Note that all of the equipment involved worked as designed. And where failures occurred, the equipment was, I should say, most all of the equipment involved worked as designed. And where failures occurred, the equipment was operated outside of its design envelope in general. This was typical of all 19 events. The severe accidents were generally not caused by random failures. We paid great attention to preventing such failures and designing so that such failures could be tolerated. And this has most certainly limited the frequency of design basis accidents. The issues leading to severe accidents can, I believe, be attributed to unrecognized hazards like the failure to recognize that a high point loader behaved differently than a design basis loader for TMI. Plant design issues like the addition of a fragile, a fragile fuel assembly sleeves and chapel cross. I can see design issues like the PORP position indicator showing the demanded position of the valve, not the actual valve position of TMI. Operating procedure issues like the instruction to delay a reactor trip on high fission product activity until confirmatory information was available at chapel cross. And maintenance issues like the poor condensate polisher procedure at TMI2. In retrospect, it's hard to identify the root causes of these issues, but the usual suspects are inadequate safety analysis, incorrect equipment specification, or inadequate information given to those who prepare training. These were subtle issues that became important only when an unexpected set of operating conditions occurred. Always more than one issue was necessary to cause a severe accident. Severe accidents involve bypass of multiple layers of defense and depth. 
You may be familiar with the defensive depth, the defensive depth is a series of fission product here. Fuel pellets, fuel plant, reactor pulling system, containment, flow population zones. But there's another, there's another system level defensive depth concept too. That's described by the International Nuclear Safety Advisory Group or INSEC. INSEC is a committee of highly experienced graders who advise the IAEA on safety. INSEC describes defensive depth as a series of systems, each independent of the other, and each backing up the preceding system. Rows three, four, and five in this table describe, <coughs> excuse me, describe the levels of defensive depth in the inset model. Reading left to right, they are first prevent abnormal operation and failure through conservative design and quality of construction and operation. Second, control anticipated operational occurrences using protection systems and other surveillance features. Third, control accidents within the site basis analysis through engineered safety features and accident procedures. Fourth, control severe accident plant conditions through supplementary, through complementary measures and severe accident guidelines or SAMGs. And fifth, mitigate radiological consequences of releases during severe accidents through offsite response measures like shuttering in place or evacuation. Each of these layers will have successful if will have successful to protect the public. I'm sure you can't read the table very well, but it's worth a closer look at some point. So here's a chart illustrating how the independent levels of defense end up were bypassed and maintained severe accidents. The boxes at the top identify the defense and depth levels and the yellow arrows that indicate the conditions that cause the bypass of each level of defense and depth. In every case, some condition bypassed multiple levels. According to the inside model, this should happen. Severe accidents happen when unrecognized dependencies called, cause the defense and depth model to break down. And I should point out, this, this picture is really a cartoon. Things are way more complicated. Real life is way more complicated, but it's, a, it's, it's an attempt to support my argument. So to help you understand the basis for my claim, I'm gonna give you the Twitter version of a few events. As a result of inadequate natural phenomena of design basis at Fukushima Daiichi, a large tsunami disabled nearly all plant systems. The lack of severe accident management procedures and associated practice hampered operators' attempts to restore full cooling and defend containment integrity. Eventually, fuel melt and partial containment failure occurred in all your three plant sessions. For a, for a kind of baseline of what I mean by a Twitter version, my Twitter version of European history is thousands of years of, of needless, needless wars and then the EU. Mm -hmm. um, operators at Chernobyl were unaware of several, of several design hazards and ignored a lot of operating limits. The operators brought the plant to a condition where a low coolant weight fraction initiated a power increase. Recognizing the problem, the operators ran the reactor, unaware that in the existing plant condition that the scram would insert reactivity and rod insertion initiated a reactivity accident. Samurai A2, the design didn't include loose parts monitor. A, 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 an in-vessel complement came loose and eventually blocked some fuel assemblies initiating fuel mount. Fission product detectors sensed the problem, but the reactor trip set point was too high to trip the reactor in time to prevent significant fuel damage. I'm gonna skip down over a couple of the next accidents so that we're not here all day. 
There are not line fuel loading at San Juan A1. Interlocks prevented the operator from loading several fuel outlets. He overrode the interlocks and loaded what he thought was fuel. Actually, what he loaded were flow restrictors, and fuel began to melt. The set points for the high efficient product activity of the reactor curve were too high, and significant fuel damage occurred before the reactor curve. Fluttery wind didn't tell loose parts monitoring system. At the last minute, as a last minute safety improvement during construction, metal plates were added at the bottom of the reactor vessel to act as a plug. During operation, bolts holding the plates corroded and some bolts came loose. Operators noted actual temperature distributions at the top of the fuel were kind of odd. But while they were trying to address that problem, uh, two of the plates floated up to the top of the reactor coil and the coil and blocked three fuel assemblies. SL1 was designed such that rapidly removing the reactor's center control rod could cause criticality. Designers believed that the operators couldn't lift that rod fast enough or high enough to cause criticality. During a maintenance activity, an operator lifted the center control rod and proved the designers wrong. <laughs> Within microseconds, a steam explosion launched the reactor vessel about 10 feet out of the operating deck. All three operators in the reactor building were killed. At the sodium reactor experiment, the chromium coolant for reactor coolant pumps leaked into the reactor vessel. Some of the petroleum coolant combined with some of the sodium reactor coolant to form a tar-like substance. During plant operation, the tar clogged coolant channels, initiating fuel damage. Before much damage occurred, a series of reactor negative rate curves occurred, indicating that something was odd in their core. But the operators reset the curves and restarted the reactor because they believed that curb instrumentation was unreliable. The reactor operated in a severe accident, in, in, under severe accident conditions for about a day before operators recognized that they had a problem. It's one of the reasons I love sodium. During the start of testing of HDR3, an untested automatic power control system was used. For this test, ion chambers used for the power control and the reactor trip system were positioned too close to the fuel, and the ion chamber high voltage power supplies were set too low. During startup of the during startup of the plant, a combination of fine neutron and gamma environment for the detectors and a low detector current due to the low voltage caused the detectors to begin working in the counts range rather than in the linear range. When that happened, indicated power decreased as the actual power increased. The automatic power control system continued to bring power up to 400% power. At that point, fuel, fuel relocation and a backup reactor trip terminated the event. During an activity to remove linear energy from the graphite in the court, one scale unit one, Plant power levels were controlled based upon fuel damage. But operators had left the fuel thermocouples in locations away from the fuel hotspots, <coughs> the plant hotspots on the floor. They couldn't know how hot were the hottest fuel elements. Two sets of fission detectors couldn't detect fuel failure because in one system, core outlet gas was not aligned to pass by the radiation detector. And in the other system, the thermal expansion of the structures intended to scan the detectors behind the fuel channel outlets bound up as the high temperatures in the reactor outlet. <coughs> Considerable fuel caught fire. So I hope I bludgeoned you into that, into, uh, in, 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 uh, in, into, under, into getting the information that, might, that you might be able to think about and uh, 
uh, and understand my assertion, the basis for my assertion. You have recognized dependencies for common cost failures, but not common cost failures of equipment, they were common cost failures of the mind. It should be a reminder to always check your intellectual blind spots. Most of your accidents have minimal effect on the surrounding area. Accidents with local consequences mainly affected only the plant site. The list above is sorted more or less in order of degree of fuel melt. Eleven of the plants in the lower two categories were eventually returned to service. It's interesting that the last four accidents were the four worst. One possible reason is that most of the other accidents involve lower power reactors, but this doesn't quite explain it because the two San Laurent units and 105K West operated at thermal power levels that were about 80% of the Fukushima Daiichi units. Severe accidents haven't caused the expected levels of radiation exposure. This is good news. At wind scale and Fukushima with mitigated actions kept the public exposures within acceptable limits. The actions taken at Chernobyl were not as successful, but still the radiological consequences to the public were lower than expected for such a horrendous accident. There's no evidence that any member of the public has suffered deterministic effects of radiation exposure from a reactor accident. And only at Chernobyl is there evidence of the public suffering stochastic effects. The United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation concluded that the Chernobyl event resulted in about 6,000 additional thyroid cancers in the human brain and relatives, and that these 6,000 cancers caused approximately 15 fatalities. This is not good, but it's significantly below what is expected. For years, our prime directive has been to spare our neighbors from harmful levels of radiation exposure. With the exception of Chernobyl, we've done that. But radiation exposure wasn't the only serious consequence of the accidents of pollution and age and Chernobyl. More than a half million people were displaced from their home for a substantial period of time. At the end of 2015, 80,000 evacuees from Fukushima to Aichi were still living away from home, and in 2017, the number was still 55,000. I have no such data for Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, but it's known that some Chernobyl evacuees decided to return on their own. About 50 people died during the evacuation of Fukushima to Aichi. The deaths that I know about were hospital patients who could not immediately be moved. They were left behind with the skeleton staff with the intent that they would be evacuated a few days later. It took longer than expected to move them to a location where they could be properly cared for. Depression and post-traumatic stress were common amongst the affected and even unaffected of those things. The 2013 survey of Fukushima evacuees determined that most were still living in the evacuation shelter. Nearly half considered themselves socially disabled due to traumatic symptoms, and nearly all thought that they or their offspring would suffer health effects from radiation exposure, when the most likely number is probably true. The 2016 study of Fukushima Daiichi determined that mortality rates amongst the elderly who had lived near the, the, the plant sites. Uh, I got this confused up. <coughs> my, my, my mouth is tied up. The ones living near the plant site, the, the, uh, uh, the, the deaths of the elderly living in the uh, plant site went up by uh, four, uh, three or four times during four months after the accident, and then it sort of returned them all. So it's, it's clear to me that our prime directive not to irradiate our neighbors is 
the opposition. The prime directive must be also must also include never making our neighbors move from their homes. <coughs> for the every reason, for the every reason, I've known that INC or HSI issues contributed to all of my accident. I concluded that the INC and HSI contributions could be contributed, could be grouped into five categories. INC functions that were needed to deal with the accident didn't exist. Existing functions that would have helped deal with the accident were not in service, usually not for reasons of normal equipment failure. Existing functions that would have helped to deal with the accident didn't have the right performance characteristics. The operators couldn't see or could not understand displays that would have helped help them to better deal with the accident. For some life, for some life cycle activities, such as an incorrect calibration or improper assembly of a fuel element to deal with the accident. Note that the large number of INC and HSI contributions reflect the fact that multiple INC contributions were involved in most of the accidents. So to recap, well, many of the events, many of the events considered are old, right? Their lessons are still relevant. Today, a generous estimate is that the frequency of severe accidents is about 10 to the minus 4 for a reactor year. We should expect further events. Severe accidents appear to be black swans, unknowns led to inadequate design, training, or procedures. Severe accidents were generally not caused by equipment failure, but by the fact that plant design, procedures, or training did not account for the unknowns. Severe accidents involve bypass of multiple levels of defensive depth. Such bypasses occur when discounted or unknown hazards introduce unexpected dependencies between levels of defensive depth. And we've done a good job of protecting our neighbors from radiation exposure, but we must do a better job to avoid moving them away from their homes when such accidents occur. So this is this this study was really interesting for me, and I don't think I fully wrung out everything that can be learned from it. It impressed me on a lot of ways that things can go wrong. <coughs> most, most of these accidents are extremely complex. Uh, causes cut across multiple disciplines. We'll probably never be able to fully eliminate the kinds of errors involved. But the study is a clear reminder that if you work on things nuclear, must avoid falling into the someone else's problem trap. The nuclear power business involves many disciplines, but no matter what our background, we're all in the end plant people. If you wish to read more, the every report is available at the URL above. If you want the IAEA accident summaries or videos, I prefer that you get them from the IAEA. Want them to know that they're being used. And if I ADA doesn't come through, let me know. And I've given the staff here uh, uh, the, the original PowerPoints and an audio version of this talk, which has a different set of mistakes. Uh, but when you get that, at the back of that, there's uh, a few pages of bibliography that uh, uh, help support some of the things that I said. And they list the main accident reports that uh, I used. So thank you very much.
At least it wasn't probably his wife. <laughs> well, the Duke is a connection to fire, and I remember reading that at the time. The fourth time it was more exciting. There, there was a person of the opposite gender involved in it. It seems like it wouldn't have been his wife. But the larger question we've had uh, accidents with aircraft where the mental health issues have been involved. That should be looked at more carefully. Yeah, that could be. But one of the, I, 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 there are a couple other things that, you know. I could talk. I could talk for an hour about any of these, but the, 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 there are a couple other things about about uh, about SL1. Because the operators were uh, non were, were privates and, and corporals from the from the army. They were not especially trained, especially well trained, and they were, uh, uh, and the. DOE had cut back on the uh, funding for the, the engineers that were overseeing them. The other thing that had, uh, that had come up was that just before this event, there was a, a, a new procedure issue that said before you restart the reactor, exercise every control rod up and down. Apparently meaning do it after you put the head back on and you do it with the, with the uh, uh, with, with the control rods in and going up from the control rod. Well, but there's some speculation that maybe this guy, without thinking, said, well, we've got to move these at work here right now. Let's just do it. Because the, the control rod would stick. Uh, so we don't know. We don't know what happened. Or why it happened. Uh, do you have a question? Gary, I, I had a uh, uh, reaction to one of the things you said that uh, just to amplify. Uh, I read a report a few years ago, I don't, can't remember where I saw it, but it, 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 it had the following thesis. That in none of these accidents was there ever, ever an operator that was found to be mentally ill in, in retrospect. In other words, there didn't seem to be any contri contribution from somebody whose mental illness or, 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 or mental state that had been undetected contributed to this. Yeah. Uh, there are a few airplane crashes where that's been true over the years, but not a, none of our, uh, of this collection of a dozen and a half have that. Yeah, so I bet, but some of these actions, I mean, you look at it and you say, why did he do that? Yeah, that's different than that. That's ones. really different, and even, so, uh, 105KW, which is, was a production plan up at Hanford, yeah, uh, one of the factors was uh, a, a technician uh, really crazily miscalibrating a flow instrument which prevented a, uh, a reactor trip on loss of flow through a fuel channel that was had a loss of flow. And there's not a lot of information there, but think about this. In 1955, there was this really kind of crazy event the accident report said, we looked at it and we decided this guy did everything in good faith and he wasn't some communist plant. You know, so, so I mean, there have been places where this has been, has been, I think, looked into more than we know. But they're crazy things, but crazy things happen. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, I think that the follow-up of what Bob is talking about, what happened to the inside? You know, this is the question that maybe uh, we're all talking about inside the threat. You know, either the control system or uh, inside the way to, to, to move damage to the threat. You know, so, but the question I really want to ask is on Fukushima. It's a PWR, and it's specifically located in Japan and on the Beijing, and they have and the earthquake happened and then the tsunami. But if I have to ask the what if question, you know, which applies to a lot of our reactors in our country, which is really inland reactor. You know, Fukushima, one of the contributing factors besides black out is loss of the long term operating system. They, they don't have any, they don't have any cooling, you yeah. know, people to see what apartment is lost. <coughs> so inland, inland plan, they have cooling tower. You know, if a tornado, I mean, tornado knock out a cooling tower, even for 
key of law, you know, automotively after what can you speculate what would happen? You know, because I'm I'm striped on your uh, on your slide on the insect and depends in that that plans and management are not you know uh, uh, are not adequate for the effects of external event. So that applies to any plan that we have, especially those inland plans that are located around the river. Yeah. Well, so. Uh, so um, one of the things I think about at <coughs> Fukushima is I, I suspect very strong. Well, first off, the operators came really close to saving units two and three. They came really close to saving units two and three. And it, and it was mainly a fact that they needed to build a battery. When they built the battery, they may have swiped the battery when they needed it in order. So, and at unit one, they were within, uh, within, well, they were they were just getting ready to push the button to start injecting water through check out level control. When the, when the explosion happened and cut all the power to that. So they came really close with no preparation, no planning, no training, no thinking through in advance anything. Well, so because the design had a large water capacity, I mean, cooling capacity. In a fresh, fresh light water reactor, the cooling capacity is so. Thin. Yeah, but I, but I mean, I, I suspect that, that Sam, uh, a good set of, of uh, 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 external event Sam Gs might have saved the whole plan. Fukushima. Yeah. And, and in fact, one of the things I think might be the answer to my, or part of the answer to my not making your neighbors move might be a really good set of Sam Gs. Uh, because they can, you know, just, just even if they could have told people we don't need station batteries, we need small batteries because we can't get the station batteries down to the plant. Get the battery from your car. You know, but you, they've never practiced it. They've never studied it. They've never written procedures. They were doing it all, and that's uh, I think it's amazing what they did accomplish. Now on the other, on the, on the, on the other statement about the inside. We don't need insiders. The people doing, the, the inside people doing the work in good conscience and the best that they think they can still make these kind of mistakes. And, and it's not really mistakes. It's, it, I mean, sometimes it may be similar, but it's, they're in a situation that they don't understand. And they do something that seems appropriate at the time. How many people have ever done that themselves? <laughs> yes, uh, it's really a uh, surprise for me that you say that uh, uh, during Fukushima accident, they were very close to actually prevent some things. Uh, it looked like the opposite because the Prime Minister came on site on uh, the second day, Saturday, and everything stopped this is the way how, uh, things work in Japan. So they lost many hours that they could have uh, prepared yeah. or, or fit. Second issue was that uh, Ongawa plant, which was 60 miles up north, that uh, was even closer to epicenter, didn't have any of these issues. They had called shut down the following morning. They had crew which was available. They had helicopter. They had uh, both diesel generators and batteries. Nobody else can to help out. So it is really strange. Well, they had a better site. They had, they had a better site. It wasn't better site. It was better preparation because they uh, had 15 meter uh, uh, calculated with their engineers and. Uh, Tepco engineers didn't, didn't believe them, so they were stuck by 7.5 meters. So these are the issues uh, that we need to know. But, but I mean, I don't think they're that they, they swamped all of the diesel generators. Uh, so they... Uh, these are generators that are flooded at Fukushima site. 
not in the other one. So they need have electricity. They need they could provide secondary you know power to Fukushima and gas. They had helicopters. Oh, yes. I, I understand, but it's so it's strange for me that you are saying that they were very close at Fukushima site to prevent these events. I don't think so. They, they were very close because they they were they were just about they were just about to put water onto Unit One and Unit Two when the explosion happened. Because they lost many hours. Well, because they lost many hours. But if, it's, if, it's, if they plan for it, if they had disciplined procedures or just disciplined activities, things would have happened a lot sooner. Uh, so unit one, I'm, I'm probably only about 70% confident about unit one, but units two and units three, they, the, the, the plants worked worked really pretty well if, given the situation. But the problem they had was that when they had to go to uh, to uh, low pressure injection, low pressure cooling, they couldn't depressurize the reactor because they built that they built battery they built a battery battery sets out of car batteries to open the uh, the, the relief valves. And when they they built the batteries, they made, they made a mistake. And they put it on, they put the battery onto the valve and it wouldn't open up. And they, they went back and six hours later, they rewired the battery and were able to open the relief valve in the unit. And three, it opened up and we don't know why. Further questions? If not, let's thank Gary again.